for this keynote night and this keynote conversation. And uh, we're thinking about someone who has uh, analyzed and understood not only where we are politically, but culturally. Uh, Dr. Hansen was certainly at the top of our list. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Victor Davis Hansen. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be back here at Pepperdine. Um, for four years, I, I drove seven, I think it was 16 Mondays, Jim Wilburn asked me to teach here, and uh, I got to know the 405, the 101, and your traffic patterns. But I came every Sunday night and taught the graduate course at the School of Public, and I, I really enjoyed it. It was a wonderful experience. I thought I'd speak for about 30 minutes and open it up to questions. Uh, have you noticed that Donald Trump incites civil war in every institution you're affiliated with? <laughs> at the Hoover Institution, we're having a civil war. At National Review, where I'm a writer, we're having a civil war. I think the war is over at the Bradley Foundation, where I'm on the board, but it's everywhere. So I guess it's good in some sense that there's a, a turmoil. But I'd like to um, ask ourselves collectively whether Trump was a catalyst or was he a symptom? If he didn't exist, would we have to invent him? I kind of think that we would. Whether we knew it or not, over the last 30, 40 years of the end of the Cold War and the globalized project, there were people who were not engaged in it or were not a beneficiary of it, and they, had a, they were developing a different view of it. And unfortunately, when you have ideological uh, divides, if they're compounded geographically, as we know from the Civil War, then it's a false multiplier. And if you look at what was happening on the East and West Coast that, of course, had physical proximity to the, the wider world, you can see that, and I want to be reductionist if it's okay with you, anybody who had used muscular labor, that task could be Xeroxed abroad. So if you were a small farmer, and you were growing raisins, the Greeks could do it cheaper. Couldn't really do it cheaper in real dollars, but because of subsidies and, and EU practices. And I saw uh, the price of raisins go from $1,400 to $400 in one year. Wiped out about 70% of the people that lived on my avenue. If you were a lathe worker, if you were a fabricator, if you were an assembler, anything that could be done elsewhere physically, uh, Anything that could not, journalism, academics, law, finance, insurance, was not only not Xerox, but it was magnif magnified in value because the market went from 300 million to six, or now 7.6 billion people. And it tended to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. It wasn't just enough that people in Youngstown, Ohio, or Bakersfield, California, were not as successful as people in Palo Alto. It wasn't just that Amazon or Facebook or Apple or the Google companies were all on the coast or 20 top universities in the world, 17 of them were in the United States, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Caltech, they're all on the coast. It's where all the major corporations. It wasn't just that fact that was accentuated through globalization, but we created a kind of ethos that we blame the victim as if, well, because it, you're not making that much money, or somebody can do something cheaper abroad, then it's your fault. And I really came, it struck me about five years ago when I was talking to a person on the farm, um, and he said to me, well, can't somebody do what you do cheaper? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you ever get up in the morning and somebody wrote a column in South Korea better than you did? And I said, no. He said, no. <laughs> and he said, well, if they could, don't you think you'd be replaced? And I said, yes. And he really, he had a point, and I don't like to read things, but I thought I, I would just read you a spectrum of what people said about the interior, the people who were not connected in the global project. And almost, you'll see what I'm, it, it, and I, I had hundreds of these uh, examples. And here's one from my own magazine, National Review, Kevin Williamson. This is a cover story, just two years ago. The truth about these dysfunctional downscale communities that they deserve to die. Economically, they are negative assets. Morally, they are indefensible. The white un American underclass is enthralled to a vicious, selfish culture whose main products are misery and used heroin needles. Donald Trump's speeches made them feel good. So does OxyContin. 
What they need isn't analgesics, literal or political. They need real opportunity, which means that they need real change, which means they need a U-Haul. Tell it to somebody who has three generations in a farmhouse or he's working in a plant in a community and you just tell them, you know, you, you lost, stupid, you didn't learn coding, get in a U-Haul. That's a very radical thing to do. It doesn't seem to have much Burkean or Tocquevillian uh, support. Here's one. We all remember ir irredeemables and deplorables. We forgot what Hillary said after the election to kind of reify that earlier statement and prove to us it wasn't a slip, but it was by intent. If you look at the map of the United States, there is all that red in the middle, places where Trump won. What the map doesn't show you is that I won the places that own two-thirds of the American gross domestic product. This is from a socialist. I won the places that are optimistic, they're diverse, they're dynamic, they're moving forward. And his whole campaign, Make America Great, was looking backward. You don't like black people getting rights, you don't like women getting jobs, you don't want to see that Indian Americans su succeeding more than you are. Whatever the problem is, I'm going to solve that. We sometimes forget that when Hillary ran in 2008, remember she said after getting off the plane, I have the support that Barack Obama doesn't. I have the white working class. And they got, uh, Barack Obama got so angry he called her Annie Oakley. Remember that? Because she was drinking <laughs> boiler makers and bowling. That same class that she tried to cultivate that turned on her, apparently, she's now turned on them. And then there was, um, this is from a conservative, Bill Crystal. Look, to be totally honest, if things are so bad as you say with a white working class, don't you just want to get new Americans instead? You can make a case that America's been great because it's a free society, a capitalist society. After two or three generations of hard work, these guys get decadent, they're lazy, they're spoiled, whatever. Max Boot, a colleague of mine on my military history task force at Stanford, kind of trump that, if I could use that term. If only we could keep the hard-working Latin American newcomers and deport the contemptible Republican cowards, that would make America great. <laughs> and I'll finish with uh, a neighbor of ours at uh, the Hoover Institution, Melinda Byerly. She was a CEO at a uh, high-tech company, and she said after the election, one thing middle America could do is to realize that no educated person wants to live in a SHIT hole with stupid people, especially violent, racist, mis misogenic ones. When corporations think about where to locate call centers, factories, development centers, they have to deal with the fact that those towns have nothing going for them. No infrastructure, just a few bars and a terrible school system. If anybody's been to Palo Alto, you can see it's got some of the worst roads in the United States. And if you see the schools, the high-tech industry have abandoned the public schools and they're going to Harker or Sacred Heart or Castilea or the Menlo School. So even their exegesis is often flawed, but it shows a deep antipathy for what we call the losers of globalization. And that was the group that we know as the Tea Party, the Reagan Democrats, the mysterious 8 to 10, 12 million people who stayed home and supposedly cost Mitt Romney the 2012 election. And so there was this pool out there, and we had the finest I think cadre of Republican nominees that we'd had much better than 2012. I mind that, I mean, there was Michelle Bachman and Herman Cain and all. We didn't have those people in 2006. We had successful governors, Scott Walker, Bobby General, senators, Rubio, Cruz. We had outsiders who were really talented, uh, Fiorina, Ben Carson. And yet we had this Manhattan real estate developer. And he was sort of like, uh, you know, the, Polly Pragmon of Athenian comedy that <laughs> screams and yells and rushes in and uh, nobody quite knew what to do with him. And what he apparently saw, what this establishment group did not, that th this geographical divide could be leveraged. And he, he looked at the alternatives to it and what the Republican establishment was basically saying is we need a kinder, gentler republicanism. We need to play by the Marcus of Queensbury rules. When Mitt Romney was in the second debate, and Candy Crawley sort of hijacked it. He didn't go outright, like Reagan did, and said, I'm paying for this or something. He just allow it to happen. Or, I mean, we haven't really had a Republican scrapper since Lee Atwater, remember him? What he did, I mean, he, he apologized for his tactics on his deathbed, but I mean, boy, when he got done with Mike Dukakis, he, the Boston Harbor pollution, the tank commercial, Whatever you felt, he was using the type of tactics that the left used, and there were people in this heartland that 
psychologically were as angry as they were hurting economically, and they just wanted somebody to fight back. Apparently, Trump, who was a product of the Manhattan dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, real estate and development world, knew that. So he kind of interloped in, and he saw that the Republican standard boilerplate, which we have, I mean, we're sort of famous at the Hoover for, and we're all supporters of free trade, free market economics, um, the post-war internationalist order that polices the world and gave us such prosperity. I, we all support it, but there was something wrong there that people in the heartland were pointing out, and that is, um, if Germany is running a $71 billion deficit with the United States and it can't afford to have more than five fighters in the air and it's on the front lines of supposed enemies and it wants us to contribute more than 2% GDP but won't, it will only contribute 0.6 and it will put a tariff on a U.S. automobile at 10% and we have to put it at 2.5. That's an imbalance. NAFTA, I, I'm a big supporter of NAFTA, I thought I was, but $69 billion trade surplus with Mexico, and did NAFTA create a kinder, gentler Mexico? Is it a, is it a safer place? At $30 billion in remittances go every year back to Mexico, and you should see it in my hometown, people line up in the Western Union office, and they will put two or $300 in cash next to the cleaners. I go and watch it happen. Many of them are on, uh, most, I think, are have some sort of social support. And yet the president of Mexico, the beneficiary of trade subsidies, $30 billion, again, is channeled through cartels back into Mexico. And yet, did NAFTA make him a close friend of the United States? He said, you know, I have a sovereign right to protect people who are illegally in the United States. I want more people to leave. And immigration policy is not, is not your own. That wasn't supposed to happen under NAFTA. It just wasn't supposed to happen. I thought to myself, if Mr. Obador is elected on July 1st, what is he going to do? Is he going to say, I demand that uh, we go from $70 billion surplus to $100 billion trade surplus with you? Is he going to say, I don't want your stinking $30 billion in remittances. It's too much a burden on our expatriates, so we're not going to take them. I want all of our 11 to 20 million people back in Mexico. They're Mexican citizens and are proud people. We don't want them in your damn country. He's not going to do that. And that you, his rhetoric, if you take it to its logical extension, <coughs> would suggest that. And so these issues were ripe to be uh, manipulated on in the Republican establishment who kept saying, don't question NATO. NATO is essential to American foreign policy. It is, but it was never envisioned that countries on the front line wouldn't contribute a merely a me meager 2%. Don't question trade, but it was never, fair trade was never defined that China had the right to expropriate technology as a, as a process of doing business in, in China. And the idea was you started to see that the post-war order it was ossified, it was calcified, it was predicated on the idea the United States is so strong and powerful that we can take a hit on trade, we can take a hit on NATO, we can take a psychological hit, we can intervene, we can create all, uh, we're sort of like Rome, if there's a Mithridates, or there's a Jugurtha, who's a troublemaker, Saddam, or Gaddafi, we can handle it. Because we're so wealthy, and we're so powerful, and yet the country was hollowed out in the middle. And these people were saying, we're not that wealthy. It's not that good for us. I don't have a job at, a, at the car plant. I don't have a job at the, uh, as a lathe worker anymore. I don't have a, a 200-acre corn. It's not so good. Stop it. And nobody in the Republican side heard it. On the Democratic side, it was identity politics, demographic, or f the future. And it was always, uh, we're going to identify you by your superficial appearance. Forget about assimilation, integration, intermarriage. It's going to be not the content of your character, but how you appear. And sometimes, I mean, because we're all linked, we, those are superficial differences, but my gosh, if we're going to accentuate them, what do you do with my neighbors or in my family where people are one quarter Hispanic or one half? Or when I taught at Cal State Fresno, I, it was absurd. We needed a Hispanic, so we bring somebody from Argentina who was a multimillionaire, and suddenly he had three accent marks and a hyphenated name, and he was chairman, and we felt so good about diversity. <laughs> So you started to see that this whole movement would require a DNA, uh, ultimately the ultimate logic of it, we would have DNA badges. And that would, you know, ascertain our ethnic purity. It's almost the one drop will of the old confederacy. 
So it was not headed in a, it's not headed in a good direction, yet when you saw it wanted a counterpoint to the, the Republican establishment played by the Marcus of Queensbury rule. We don't want to be called a racist. We can't be called a nativist. We're not a protectionist. We had all these words that we don't want to be called. But this sizable pool of people w was waiting. So Donald Trump came in, and he had a populism. That's a dirty word, but really, in the history of Western civilization, there's two populisms. There's what the ancients called the good populism and the bad populism. We flipped it. The ancients' bad is our good, and their good is our bad. In the ancient world, the city, large urban populist underclass was railing for really two things, cancellation of debts, I, I lost Bernie Sanders, and redistribution of property and overseas imperialism. The entire Athenian imperial project was built on the backs of the Thetes. And the answer to that, or the answer to Catiline and uh, the late Roman Republic populism of, of Rome, which grew to be a million people, was the agrarian populism that said, no, we want a small farming uh, contingency that, uh, constituency, excuse me, that fights in the army, they, they are agrarian, they vote, but they have some qualifications to participate in democracy. It's sort of what Edmund Burke was talking about, the power of legacy and custom and tradition, or Tocqueville was talking about uh, an anecdote to radical equality. So that populism was there, and it was not considered dirty as it is today. It was a broad-based idea that a citizen has certain rights and responsibilities and living in the same place or honoring traditions of the past with understandable change when they needed to be changed was not a bad thing. And yet we had demonized that group and called them all sorts of names. So this was all there to be leveraged. There was one final ingredient that I don't know quite how Trump saw it if he did see it, and that was how do you uh, reify all of these existing situations into a political agenda that can win? And he, he focused on, I think, four issues. Globalization, which I talked about. Trade, which he said is not fair. You would call it free, but it's not fair. And, and he had a very reductionist, simplistic attitude. He always would say, if you remember the debates, well, if it's so good, why doesn't Germany do, you know, adopt our policy? Or it's so good, why doesn't China do what we do? Or if it's so good, why do not these other countries do what we do? Or if it's so good that we have NATO, why doesn't Germany, per and so it was always, well, wait a minute, if it's so, if, if we're doing things so great and everybody else that has it so bad, why, are, why don't they just switch? And they didn't want to switch. People kind of made fun of it, but it was a powerful argument. The second thing was illegal immigration, and he, he really turned that issue to his advantage. He basically said, what is so moral or ethical about the first thing you do when you enter a foreign country is you break the law, and the second thing you do is you break the law by residing in it not just breaking the law for the border. And he turned it almost to an ethical view. I went back and looked at speeches. It was always, well, these other guys are waiting in line, and they're trying to wait legally. This is not fair to them. And then he got onto the crime issue, and people would say, well, out of 13 or 14 million people, there's only a million people, so that's less than 8 or 9% have committed a felony. And he'd say, well, nobody should commit a felony. If a guy comes into your house, you have a higher expectation of behavior. And so he had these arguments that were not answered. And when they channeled into globalization that why do we lower the wages of Americans of the, of the lower classes, so to speak, or at least the entry level class. And that was an attempt to appeal to people on class rather than racial lines. It explains why the Haas, Haas School of Journalism just had a poll, if you remember, 54% of Californians want more deportation. 41, 49, excuse me, percent of Latinos polled they want more deportations. I was in the bank the other day and a woman said to me, a Hispanic woman that I've known since high school, she said, hey, Victor, you seen ICE lately? And I said, I did see ICE lately. They just busted six people on my, about a half a mile from my house, covered with tattoos. They, you know, they came in with the pickups. They didn't look like cars. They had them all. She goes, oh, great. We call them all the time. They, we tell them what time they're going to be home. We want to, and I said, well, what's the consequences? And she said, the consequences are they call us from Oaxaca and tell us they're going to come back and kill us within a few hours of arrival. So it's, a, it's not what the media says. I don't find from autopsy and personal experience. That was another issue that 
that really resonated that Trump saw that even though he was crude and clumsy and often cruel in the way that he articulated it, then there was finally the, the post-war order and that was uh, the idea that going to Afghanistan or going to Iraq or bombing uh, Libya, and of course he was simplifying and he wasn't going to get, we, you can call him an isolation, but he wasn't a Lindbergh isolate. We have 800 bases overseas. We still have 800 bases 200 years later. When he said bomb that blank out of ISIS, that meant intervening overseas and using military force for the common good. A lot of it was rhetorical, but not all of it. And I, I, this really, uh, when he started to say these things, um, and I supported the Iraq War, I remember I was in in bed for 2006 for a week and 2007 for two weeks during the surge. And I remember talking to all these guys over there, and they all fit a pattern below the, eight, uh, the rank of colonel. They were mostly from <coughs> the Midwest or rural upstate New York or places like Tulare, California. And they, they really read the papers and I was thinking that the, a lot of the people who had really advocated for the war, not people who joined it and said, so we might as well get rid of the SOB, he's a genocidal monster, but the project for the newest American century or all of these people. I remember, do you remember the Vanity Fair in 2006? It was called ne uh, Neocon Regrets. And here were they all there, the architects, and they all said it was a stupid idea and basically it was my brilliant war was ruined by your terrible peace. In other words, you just listen to me and not listen to X, Y, and Z, and therefore I don't support it anymore. And I thought what Matthew Ridgway said after Korea, when they asked him, why in the hell did he go to Korea to bail out McCarthy? He said, there's only one worse thing than a bad war, and that's losing it. And that's what it was struck by people there. They were, they were saying, well, we didn't want to go over here, but once we're going to go over, let's get rid of the SOBs and win. And yet the people said, go over there and we're going to remake the world in the, the image of Carmel. As soon as things got bad, whether it was Richard Pearl or, or other people, he said, I don't want any part of it. And that, and that resonated too. So he had a lot of things um, going for him that people didn't appreciate. And uh, the final demographic reality was, and a lot of people have written about this, Yes, demogra demography is destiny, but if you start to look at individual rubrics, you can see that many of the new demographics were already in blue states. So by that I mean, yes, New Mexico has flipped, yes, Colorado has flipped, yes, Nevada has flipped, yes, California has flipped. And it's very hard for a Republican president to start off when you're losing an addition, 180 or so electoral votes with states like Illinois, New York, California, Minnesota, Michigan against you. But Trump had figured that some of these things were not going to flip. Georgia has a higher Hispanic population, Texas a much higher, but they weren't going to flip, not yet. But what could flip were these purple states, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, a lot of electoral votes and uh, a lot of disgruntled people. And he made the gambit or the bet that two things were going to happen. He could appeal to those people in a way that Mitt Romney never could. So the conventional wisdom that Donald Trump is the only Republican of the six, 17 candidates who could lose was going to be flipped on its head. He's the only one that could have won because he's the only one that would appeal on these issues I just mentioned in these states which had the electoral calculus for victory. And nobody quite appreciated that. And then second, he, appealed, he thought that the high uh, minority registration and turnout in some communities, the black community, probably 92% uh, of blacks voted for Obama, record turnout, uh, Asians perhaps 65, Latinos 65 to 70. That vote and that enthusiasm was not transferable to a 69-year-old white multimillionaire named Hillary Clinton with a lot of negatives. And those were two brilliant deductions that even though he lost the popular vote, it, it won. And so, Republicans have not had 51% majority vote since Michael Dukakis' election defeat in 1988, and they've lost five of the six last presidential elections at a time when they're very successful at the local and state level, and he understood that. I want to conclude this, what in the world is he then? Is he chemotherapy that he is crude and he can be obnoxious that's necessary to kill the administrative cancer? I, I've mentioned elsewhere, I think he's more like a tragic hero. Before you get angry and say there's nothing heroic about Donald Trump, well, there's nothing heroic about a tragic hero as we understand the usual term hero. The word comes from Sophocles and Homer, 
Achilles, Ajax, Philoctetes, Oedipus. And what it means is that a particular individual is facing a tragic dilemma. That is, that they have the skill sets necessary to solve the problem or to address issues that cannot be addressed because of a calcification or a stasis in the situation. So if you're uh, the Achaeans on the plain of Troy, there's only one SOB that can kill Hector. The problem is he's not kingly. He's not Agamemnon, the deep state king, or Menelaus' his brother. But if you want some obnoxious young punk from Thessaly to go in and kill Hector, Achilles is your man. But then you'd, what are you going to do with him when, he's, when you're done with him? And um, if you look at Ajax's soliloquies and Sophoclean plays, they're just trumpy into the core. I should have got more credit for for what I did at Troy. They didn't give me Achilles' armor. They cheated me. They rigged the election. He just, it's, it's just it's overwhelming. And we have these deep state characters in real life. If you remember Curtis LeMay, if, you, if it's 1945 and it's March and you've spent $2 billion, twice the cost of the Manhattan Project, and you have 2,000 B-29s that don't work, in other words, they go up to 30,000 feet beautifully, they drop bombs on a 400-mile jet stream and the bombs are off target and you're losing 10% of your fleet every month because of the wear and tear of the engines and some nut with a cigar comes in and says, I'm going to take those SOB planes and go down 6,000 feet and load them up with napalm and burn the industrial core. Then you can win the war. But what do you do with that person after the war? You don't want him around. You can put him in sack or you can make him a character of Dr. Strangelove, General Buck Turgenson, because that's how or you can have him run with George Wallace and be sort of going to infamy. So we have, and same with George Patton. You don't want George Patton as Allied uh, commander of Shafe, the, the, uh, the invasion force and the Allied force. That's what you want Eisenhower for. You don't want him getting in front of cameras if you want a sober and judicious um, statement along Omar Bradley. On the other hand, you do not want Omar, Omar Bradley or Eisenhower controlling this complete strategy of the Normandy follow-up. You need somebody who knows how to fight and move fast and get to the Rhine with the fewest number of casualties. Then after the war, you do not put him as Bavarian proconsul, which we did, and he, you know, he lasted about six weeks. And then he was the stuff of character. Exactly a person who read Latin, spoke fluent French, very erudite, but he said things uh, and he addressed problems that could not be addressed and said in the way that he did so. We, I'll just finish with a, this genre we know from the Western. If you think of, I don't know, most people don't watch Westerns anymore. We think of John Ford's classic, The Searchers, with John Wayne. Remember, he has a really bad past, some kind of Confederate business. I don't know, he was in the Kansas uh, Blood Wars. And he, we don't really know what he's going to kill Natalie Wood, his, his niece he's looking for. But people, if they want to find the kidnapped girl, they're going to have to bring him in. And when he's, at, he, when he's done, you've got to open that door and make sure he walks out and does not stay around. To civil, he's not the kind of people civilizations are building. Remember the end of the Magnificent Seven? Uh, Yul Brenner says, <laughs> well, um, I guess we're going, they're very uh, happy now that we got rid of the bandits. He said, yeah, they're going to be even happier than when we leave. And what he was saying is that, and then he says, we lose, we always lose. Same thing with uh, Shane. Uh, Shane is not the person that you want to go into that final gunfire and shoot at uh, Jack Palance and wound him in the hand or debate with him. You want him to kill him. And once he's killed him, he can't be a part of that society anymore. These are sodbuster civilizers. Same thing if you, uh, more of a modern analogy. Remember Dirty Harry movies at the end? Clint Eastwood really commits two, suicide, uh, two murders. He murders the Scorpio killer and gives him. You feel lucky punk and blows him away, but by blowing him away, he blows away his own career. He, he murdered somebody. Same thing with uh, Denzel Washington, Man on Fire. If you want to find uh, the, the kidnapped girl, then you've got to bring in Denzel Washington. When you bring in Denzel Washington, you get a whole other cargo of things you don't want. So the tragic hero is usually a person who decides to enter a situation in which he's going to lose, but he can be of utility. And I think that's sort of what Donald Trump did. I do not think there is a Republican politician running for office or in office who would have moved the embassy to Jerusalem, who would have got out of the Paris Climate Accords, who would have canceled the Iran deal, who would
who would have told the, the North Koreans they're, they're dealing with some very serious problems, would have opened Anwar up, got the tax cut through, or tried to deal, well, build a wall. I just don't think they exist. And I think the fact that somebody did do all of those things means that when they're accomplished, uh, the people he benefited in his party and the American people at large will be very happy to see him go. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if I talked to him. I don't know if you have time for a question. Yeah.